share my presentation right away. And so I hope you see my screen. Yes. And yeah, so uh, the topic of my today's pitch is uh, contract testing in .NET using Pactio library. So um, let's move on quickly to the agenda. Uh, during this presentation today, we'll know what uh, the contract testing is. We will get familiar with some contract testing uh, techniques and key items. And then after this general um, overview, we get some knowledge about the Pactio library and how to work with it. And we will see the real usage in uh, some short demo session where I can show you some real examples with different test cases, how to inter integrate your Pactio library into your source code. Then we will uh, talk a little bit about different contract testing and contract uh, sharing strategies and how to integrate Pactio tests in your CICD pipeline and how to share your artifacts between your components. And especially we'll be talking about the Pact Broker uh, tool and during the second demo session. And at the very last uh, item, we will talk about how to reach uh, this term as Pact Nirvana. So let's get things started. And we'll start with what contract testing is. So the formal definition of contract testing as a technique for testing integration point by checking each application or participant in isolation to ensure that the messages or the data uh, sends or receives conform to a shared understanding that is documented in um, a contract. So this is a new term that appeared here. Um, in the simple words, um, understand the contract testing as a technique or methodology to ensure that all of our participants that involved in communication shares the same, the same understanding of the payload of the data that it transferred from and to and some rules that should uh, those parties follow. And let's unwind this uh, contract testing term uh, more deeply. So, Let's start with uh, the question, why do we even need the term as contract testing? Because we already have some integration tests, we already have unit tests. Why do we need another type of tests in our source code? So uh, let's start with the problem. Let's assume that uh, we have the simple multi-service architecture. So we have the provider service and the consumer service. And we need to be sure that our provider works correctly with other applications, uh, let's say consumers. And to do this, we traditionally run some complex integration tests uh, on some test environment using the live deployed applications. The key point here is live. So all of the consumers and providers should be deployed and run on some test environment uh, at the same time to ensure that we really can communicate with uh, each other. And uh, while live is crucial, uh, of course, this is because there is nothing to ensure that the simulated applications or mocked uh, proxy servers or whatever behave in the same way as the real ones. So that's why we always have to work with live uh, servers. But um, why do we need the contract test? Why do can't we just work with the integration test? Of course we can, but uh, the contract testing allows us to be more specific in what we actually wanted to do. So. Uh, the contract testing operates with the term as a contract. Contract is a formal uh, specification uh, of expected behavior and communication rules between uh, two or more components, services, systems. It defines uh, different inputs, outputs, and interactions uh, to ensure that all the parties that involved in this communication meets each other's expectations. So um, it will talk about the integration test. Uh, we, with, with help of integration tests, we can test the real behavior of the different uh, parties. So we can test the behavior of the consumer part or the provider part. And in order to write uh, the proper integration tests, you somehow need to be aware of some internal stuff. So about the business logic. But with the contract testing, everything that has happened on the provider or the consumer side can be a black box. So we shouldn't know anything about that. The other thing that we should be aware of is the way of communication and the format of data that is transferred from and to. And this is why the 
contract testing can be run in isolation. So we do not need to deploy our consumer and provider at the same environment at the same time to perform testing. And we will unwind that a little bit later. And the last point is when. So when we actually need the contract testing. Um, essentially, we can go to with the contract testing in various of scenarios, but the most popular ones is when you have a microservice architectures, but it's not limited to all the microservice architecture. It can be even just straight communication between front end and back end if you have two different applications. So if your front end and back end teams are completely separate from each other. And um, in general, it is applicable when multiple services or components interact with each other and we need to ensure that these interactions work properly. So let's move forward. And uh, previous slide, I mentioned the term uh, such as a contract. So let's unwind this term and get know what the contract is. So the contract is basically a set of rules that our consumer and provider should follow. So I'm usually thinking about the contract um, in the next way. So the contract is some sort of a file in some format that we can provide to a consumer or the provider and they can verify their behavior and their uh, inputs, outputs against that contract. So that's the shared understanding that consumer and provider teams can follow. So these are the key aspects that a good and well-structured contract uh, should contain. The first of all, it should contain the interface. The, interfa the interface is the general, um, the general definition for different methods, functions, uh, API endpoints that our consumer and provider accepts. The next uh, item here is prerequisites. So prerequisites is the set of rules that can be totally optional. So uh, some contracts uh, don't include these steps in their specification, but the prerequisites are generally a set of rules that our consumer provider should follow before each interaction uh, between each other. Uh, the next thing is pass conditions. Pass conditions is primarily the same as prerequisites, but in the opposite way. So pass conditions is something that happened after each request or um, communication or like message sharing or whatever. So basically it can be like uh, response format, different status codes, different uh, response headers and cookie files, etc. cetera. Uh, the next bullet point here is invariant. So invariants uh, are a set of rules that always apply throughout the integration between services. It can be some authorization headers that, should, that can and should be passed with each request. It can be some, um, cookie um, values that should have been passed with each uh, request and it should return with each response. So all of these are called invariants in terms of the contract. Uh, the next thing is like the most obvious, uh, but not, uh, not optional and very important one is the data form. So it should be aligned in the data format that we use for all the parties. So it can be like JSON, XML, plain text, any other. And last but not least is error handling. So this is the set of rules that defines the behavior of our system if something goes wrong, intentionally or non-intentionally. So for example, if some uh, server or provider runs uh, crashes or we expect some downtime or uh, timeouts. So this is the set of rules um, that defines what we should expect from our provider if this case has happened on their side. And the next thing that I wanted to talk about uh, when we already get familiar with um, contract term and talk in general about the contract testing and why it's needed, I want to be more specific and um, tell you about these two, uh, this two topics. So the, the first one is city city and the second one is city city. So city city stands for the consumer driven contract testing. And, this one stands for the provider or producer driven contract testing accordingly. Uh, I will talk more about the consumer driven contract testing because uh, this is more important in terms of the packed IO usage. But um, if going a little bit ahead, the provider driven is exactly the same, but in the opposite order. So our starting point 
uh, goes from this part to this one. So we started from provider team and all of this uh, errors and cycles goes exactly in the opposite way. But yeah, let's start with the consumer one. So uh, it will talk about the consumer driven contract testing. Everything starts with the team collaboration. So uh, let's imagine that we have two different projects. One of them is the pre uh, consumer part and another one is the provider or producer project. And we have two different uh, set of teams with uh, their own developers, QA members, even DevOps engineers. And we need to somehow be sure that our consumer meets the expectations from the provider and vice versa. So they both talk in the same way that shares the same logic and uh, different data transferring and so on. So we'll start with the collaboration. So the consumer team should collaborate with the provider team and define those set of rules that both of this application need to follow. Then uh, once it's done, the consumer team starts implementing their uh, consumer application totally separately. Once it's done or some, some part of it is done, uh, they should write their contract tests on the consumer side. Uh, totally separately from uh, separate from the provider side. So they write their own contract tests. And at the end, as a result of this contract test, they should uh, they should get their contract. So the file, the, the contract that we just uh, invited in the previous slide. They get that file and, and basically that's it from the consumer side. So they defined in this contract their expectations from the provider team. The next step is they have to share that expectation, share their, that contract files with the provider team. And for this, we will we'll see that later, but let's assume that for this, they use some uh, contract broker, some, some technology to share and maintain those files. And that's it. This part is totally automated uh, by the consumer side. And the provider side can go uh, totally in parallel. So they can start implementing their uh, provider application. They can start write their provider tests, but in order to uh, properly write and of course execute them, they need to have the contracts. They need to have that set of rules defined by the consumer side. So they download the contract from that shared repository. Let's say it's a contract broker. And once they download, they can run their provider contract test and verify that they met the expectations from the consumer. So they can be sure that all of this, this both applications works uh, in the same and proper way. So this is basically the whole cycle of contract testing and how it should work in general without any link to any technology for now. But if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we will start talking about the PAC.io. So the PAC.io is the technology or basically a library that allows us to uh, write and uh, our contract tests. So basically uh, the formal definition of it is the code first consumer driven contract testing tool. There are two main points here. The one is the consumer driven contract testing tool, which means that we go back to the previous slide, which means that we're going uh, in this way. So we're starting with the consumer side and then we share our expectations with the provider and the provider team verifies that expectations from us, from the consumer side. And another one, um, Another point here is the code first. This is pretty important because this thing clearly identifies that the contract testing is a subset of an integration test. And why it's called code first, we can see that on this pretty simple diagram here. So everything starts with the consumer uh, side. As a consumer team, we should, uh, of course, implement our consumer and then start writing our contract tests. In the PACTIO world, all of the uh, contract tests from the consumer side is defined as a uh, unit test. So you simply write your unit test against mocked uh, provider server, which is pretty important here because in uh, real integration tests, you cannot mock uh, the other party 
So if you have the straight communication between your consumer and provider, if you mock the either consumer or provider, you cannot get the 100% uh, percent sureness that everything goes in the same way as it will go in a real uh, production. So the purpose of integration tests is essentially to uh, execute them and run against some real deployed applications. But in the, the contract testing, especially using Pactio, we can start with the consumer by writing a simple unit test. And at the end of this unit test, at the second uh, step, we will get a contract that we can share with the provider team. So once we get a contract, so once uh, the unit test has been written and executed successfully, we get a contract and we share the contract with the provider team using one of the predefined technologies by the packed team. Uh, it can be packed broker or packed flow. We will talk about it later. But for now, we use some technology to share this contract with the provider team. The provider team uh, at their end starts verifying that contract on their side. So they also write a set of unit tests, but that can be tested in isolation from the consumer. So these two parties are, they do not cross between each other. But the main uh, point here is that in order to verify our expectations on the provider side, we need to deploy and run our application on some test environment. So yeah, on the provider side, we still need to ensure that we have run our provider application in some like real environment, not prod, but some test environment. But at least we do not have to run them um, in a tight couple with the consumer side, which is a pretty good benefit in comparison of uh, the integration tests. And uh, yeah, so uh, this is the time for my first demo when I will show you the exact usage of, of the Packtail. So I'll stop sharing and share my screen once again. Uh, oops, not this one, sorry. So, yeah, so you should see my visual studio right now. I hope yes. so. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So um, this is my uh, pretty simple uh, demo that doesn't really, uh, doesn't really very compact, complex. So I can briefly go through the all the structure and different projects. So I have a single solution here, which called the contract testing, and I have two different uh, web applications here. I call them uh, producer and consumer accordingly. So let's start with the producer. So producer is simply a web API application written in .NET eight. And it exposes only two endpoints and this and this point. Yeah, so we have one uh, get endpoint to get uh, the list of countries and one pass endpoint to add some currency. Uh, the way how it does, it just um, connects with some third party provider. Uh, this provider, I, I think some of you for sure uh, know that uh, tool as restcountries.com. So this is the provider that can provide us some like wide range of information about almost all the countries in the world. So like uh, the country code, the currencies, the, I don't know, language, uh, the full name of that country, different regions and et cetera, et cetera. So this provider is just get everything from that rest countries by some uh, filtering. Uh, using some filtering and then accepts that as a query parameters. And it also performs a pretty dummy post action here. So we can insert some new currency into the country name, but no real request to that uh, rest countries are happened. We just uh, returns 200 if everything is okay and perform some sort of validation. If, and if not, if it doesn't meet our expectations, we'll just return the bad request. So yeah, that's basically for the provider side. And the consumer is a simple Blazor uh, web application. It has um, two pages. One is the fetch data that just made a request to our provider to get the data based on some 
filtering that user can type and and an add, add data page as well. So you can just type the name of your country, some information about currency and made a post request to the provider site. And that basically it for these two applications. The main uh, point here is this other two projects in, in the solution. So I have two different projects for uh, contract testing for, uh, for the consumer and provider or producer uh, side respectively. So if I go to, let's start with the consumer because Pactio is a consumer driven contract testing tool. And I have two different test suits here. So the first one is to test our uh, get communication with the provider and the other one to test our post communication with the provider. So um, yeah, at this point, let me just let me just start those applications not to show you how it looks like. So I hit .NET run on my producer. Okay, it's built. So if I go here, hit refresh. Yeah, so as you can see, this is a simple swagger page and these are two different endpoints that my provider exposes. And if I run my consumer application, it will, yeah, okay. It should be fine now. Yeah, so uh, it will show you just a pretty simple UI where we have two different pages, fetch data and a data. So for example, you know, if I enter this set of data and hit submit, it is loading and it returns the single record here. And it is returned exactly what we type here. So that's basically how our consumer provider interaction works. And yeah, but let's get back to uh, the tests. So at uh, this point, we wanted to sure to be sure that our consumer um, meets some requirements from the provider side, and the provider shares that expectations from the consumer side. And we start with the consumer side. So we are in get countries uh, test suite, and here we had set of unit tests. So we have one, two, one, two, yeah. So basically uh, for this one, I I have written only two different unit tests and each of them verifies some specific, one specific rule uh, towards the producer. So for example, this one verifies that uh, the producer should return only one matched country uh, based on the parameters that we sent to it. So let's unwind what happens in a single uh, unit test on the consumer side. Um, the first step is, uh, of course, the arrange. So we should define our expectations in terms of the data. So we have our example uh, request or payload or query parameters in our case, and we have our ex example response. So we have some response that we're expected to get from the provider. Uh, the next thing is totally tied to the packed library. So in order to uh, write this code, you have to integrate your packed library into your unit test project here. And it's basically pretty simple. It should, uh, you should include only these two packages. So the first one is just pack.net, which is the main package for performing the contract tests using pack.io. This is the latest table version at this point. And another one is just the outputter for uh, X unit unit tests in order to debug your contract testing, the uh, contract tests. So I will show you that in a moment. Um, that basically it for this part. And once you uh, install that packages and add it to your project, you can write this type of code. So what does all of these lines uh, mean? Uh, the first of all is on line 29, we have this packed object. Packed object is just the starting point of any uh, contract tests in, in the packed.io world. So I have just a 
pretty simple set class that sets up this object object for us. Uh, there are actually a lot of different options here, but I used only three necessary ones. So the first one is the packed director. The packed director is the place where you uh, you will put your contracts or your packs. That's how the contract file calls in Pactail. Uh, at the end of the day, you will generate uh, your contract files and you want to share them with your provider team. So you have some story, some place where you have to put them. So this is just a, a really the path to uh, the directory where those packs are stored. And this is just in the root of the solution. Yeah, I have this packs folder here. So that's basically what it means. The outputters is the set of outputters that can be used to debug your uh, test and to store your logs um, from the packed uh, builder. And the log level is just like the obviously log level. There have some, yeah pretty common uh, levels that we all know. Um, so, and uh, I think that's it for in terms of the configuration. And the next line is just to actually build our packed builder uh, with this string. And at the end of the day, we return our packed object, but this is an important method that we called here. Uh, this is the method with which we tell how we can how we will mock our provider. Because if you remember on my slide, I mentioned that we run our consumer part against our mocked provider, which is pretty important because we, uh, with this um, with the solution, we can easily test our consumer in total isolation from the provider. So uh, it's basically for the pack setup. And if we go to our test, you can see that uh, in a constructor, we uh, built our packed builder object. And then with the chain of responsibility, we can set up our rules against which we wanted to verify our provider. So um, the first part should always start with upon receiving. So this block uh, is responsible for different set of requests, prerequisites, past conditions, or etc. So for instance, in this case, uh, we say that Upon receiving anything from the provider, we should, and this should be a unique string to identify our rule. So for example, if I copy this string and put here, uh, our packed uh, builder cannot make any distinguish between these two tests, even if there are actually separate unit tests, it will put uh, all of them into one single rule in, uh, in the final contract file, which we don't want. So that's because that's why we have to define a unique string. Usually it just like a short description of what we expect from the provider. So for example, in this case, we expect that uh, we will receive, uh, with a valid request, we will uh, receive some set of filtered contracts. Uh, after that, uh, all of this uh, are completely optional. So in my case, since I don't have any payload or request body and I use just uh, simple query parameters, I validate only them. So I tell my pack builder that I wanted to make a get request to this endpoint with this set of query parameters. And that's it for the request part. And the next thing is that I declare that my provider should respond me with this information. So it should return me the 200 OK status. This is the first part. And the second part is that it should return me a response with the JSON format. And this is how it should look like. So I perform some sort of a type matching here. And I go, if I go to that method, I wanted to receive exact this information from my producer or provider. This is what basically does this unit test and that's it. And yeah, of course I have some headers to double check, but it, it's totally optional as well. And the only thing that is really mandatory here is this two methods. And that's it. This piece of code is exactly the same for 
any sort of a unit test uh, here. So for example, uh, for this one, I just called the verify async method here. And everything that I should do is to call my mocked provider in order to uh, send the request to it and get some response. So for example, right here, I should get my HTTP client that I defined just for my unit tests. So I have some pre dummy client factory. Um, yeah, I just, it, it doesn't do anything except it uh, sets as a base URL my provider URL. So my mock provider URL. It is defined automatically by pack, so you don't have to memorize any ports or whatever. And that's it. I just um, request my mock server with this uh, with this query parameters, and I make get requests to this endpoint. And I expect uh, in an assertion uh, assertion block, I expect that we should get the two hundred status code. The list of countries shouldn't be null, and I should get the single uh, country in that area. So that basically. Another uh, test verifies almost the same, except, uh, yeah, it should return an empty error if no match is found. So I just put some pretty dummy values in the query parameters, and it verifies that my list of countries is empty. And also, it has like 200 status code. So um, if I go to the post test suit, it basically does exactly the same. So we have several, three different unit tests here. It verifies um, some payload, some response. Yeah, you can, you can write anything you want with this crunch. And if I go and run all of those tests, uh, all of them should be run and executed successfully. And at the end of this run, yeah, so I have overall five tests and all of them are passed. At the end of the day, in the packs folder, you will see two different files, each file per each test suit accordingly. So if we go to, for example, countries, consumer and countries provider packed file, it just simply JSON file with all of my interactions. Interactions is basically one uh, unit test. So yeah, we have a description, for example, a valid request to retrieve a filtered country. And given uh, some country that is already exist, then we have a request block, which describes what we pass to the provider and the response block that uh, this is basically what we expect to retrieve from the provider. We have some expected headers to return and we have some matching rules. For example, I wanted to match that our response is exactly the same type as we expect. So yeah, this is this should be the area of the country's uh, model. And yeah, at the end, we will have the status matching. So it should return us uh, with the status 200. The same for another test case here. So yeah, 200, but an empty body, the same headers and et cetera. So let's go to the producer part. The producer part of part is very similar. So the only thing that we need to do is to configure our um, uh, packed builder as well as uh, the server to start our provider. So in, um, in this project, in a unit test project, in a test startup, I have this, um, pretty like weird in terms of the unit test configuration. So I actually started my Kestrel web server in order to launch uh, and run my provider. So in the real world, this provider can be run uh, like in a sep as a separate process and as a everything that is here can be um, can be run as a separate step in your CICD pipeline. So everything can be launched and some test environment, but just for the demo purpose, I'll do that the same uh, in, in the same project as a, a prerequisites in order to launch any test, uh, any producer test project. So yeah, that's basically nothing too 
talk about here. It's just a uh, standard uh, methods that called in any program file in any web API application. So yeah, we'll just add some uh, some middleways here, uh, some routing, exposing some endpoints, map controllers, and yeah, nothing nothing special. Uh, the really interesting part here goes in uh, unit tests itself. So for each of uh, the packed files, we have to have a separate uh, test suite and test class in terms of the X unit. So um, each of this uh, looks exactly the same. So each of this should have only one unit test, which verify everything from uh, from that packed. So for example, in this packed file, we have three different rules because we have three different uh, cases or uh, unit tests on the consumer side. And with only a single unit test, we can verify everything from it. So we start from the range point. This is pretty much the same as on the consumer side. So we uh, configure our pack builder um, or pack verifier. I would call it on the producer side. And, uh, but the, the config is exactly the same. We have that uh, output, debug level, and et cetera. And then we tell our packed uh, builder or packed verifier from we, where we wanted to download our contracts, our packed files. Yeah, so we just define the directory and the exact packed file name against which we wanted to check our provider. And that's it. This uh, act in its third part is exactly the same for each of the tests. So for example, we should uh, tell that we wanted to download our packs from this file source and provide the full path to the file. And then we wanted to tell where we actually wanted to make a request. So this is the uh, server URL where our uh, provider actually run. So this is pretty important, it's crucial uh, factor here because we have provider URL in, in the fixture and it can be, it can take this parameter from some configuration file. I just hard coded it. So this is the uh, URL, exact this URL. Yes, yeah, you can see exact this URL. So. I have already uh, launched and deployed my uh, packed, uh, I'm sorry, my uh, provider uh, application so I can make any request to the real instance of it. And if I go and run my tests on the provider side, it should execute it uh, successfully. Yes, yeah, so I had two different tests and two of them passed. It means that everything that is described in these two packed files have been successfully validated. And uh, the other important part that I wanted to show you is uh, in Visual Studio, for example, in the output, we have this output uh, providers and we have at the very bottom, I have this test provider. So this is basically the output that we've configured for the consumer or provider side. So this is basically everything that you should know about your test because everything is okay, it, it doesn't say much. But for example, if I go and uh, let's say on the consumer side, I say that I wanted to have this header as the response from my provider. So I wanted to have the cache control with max h, like this time value. Okay, so I want to Okay, I can run just this test. I want to run this test. It should execute successfully because this is just what we expect from the producer. And we have all the uh, all the permissions to expect this from it. So yeah, it's been passed. But if I go to the country's API test and try to run this test, it should fail because we're not actually returning this header as a part of our response. Yeah, it's been failed. And all the details you can find under this test uh, logs. So if you go here, and yeah, as you can see, there are a lot of logs because something goes wrong with this test. And if you 
go a little bit up. Yeah, this is exactly what we exactly what we were looking for. So it says that we're we're trying to verify this uh, packed file, and the test has been failed because it should include this header cache control with this value, but uh, actually the cache control header doesn't exist because like yeah it was just empty, so we're not returning that header is a part of our response. So yeah, this is basically how uh, everything of it works in a, in a real world. And uh, I think I can go back to my presentation. So I will share. Okay, so we're done with the, the first demo. We'll just, uh, I just showed you how to set up your pack test, how to uh, run and execute them against uh, real provider and provider side, against mock provider and consumer side, how to generate your packed files or contracts. And we can move forward to the next important topic as packs sharing. In my demo, I introduced you how I share my packs. I just put them, all of them in one single directory and I download them from that directory on the provider side. But essentially, the pact or a contract is just a file. So it's an artifact that we generate as a result of all our consumer tests. And since this is just an artifact, we can use any um, available tool for us to actually store and maintain our artifacts, such as, for example, Nexus, uh, Artifactory, any other uh, available tool for it. But in a pact your world, there are actually two different and common ways to store and share your packed files. There are packed broker and packed flow. What's the difference between all of them? Packed broker is this standalone solution that it was developed by the packed team itself. It is an open source, so you can be a contributor to it. And it's self-hosted, which means that you have to um, manually install them and control all of its life cycle. So in case of some uh, failures or crashes, you have to manually uh, get everything up once again. Uh, the PackFlow is also a standalone solution. Uh, it's open source, but it was developed by some other, I don't know, par party of uh, contributors, some other third party team. And uh, the one, the only disadvantage uh, in, in comparison of PackBroker is that it's not so frequently updated. That the pack broker is always up to date with the recent versions of Pact, so we can get all the new features here and uh, communicate with pack broker from our code. And uh, yeah, I I I'm not sure about the pack flow how they can actually update their uh, repository and how frequently it happens. But essentially, these are two options are pretty similar. So uh, I will talk more about Packbroker because I've used this one, but yeah, it doesn't really mean, even in terms of the production code, what you want to use. So essentially, how uh, would the use the power of Packbroker? We can see this diagram, and uh, this is how it can be done with the usage of either Packbroker or Packflow. So now we see this, um, this pipeline here. So the consumer test has been executed successfully and new packed file has been generated. So in order to share it with the provider team, we don't need to uh, put it into some, uh, I don't know, folder or whatever. We just wanted to publish it to some uh, pack broker instance. And on the provider side, we will download them by the URL from that instance. It, it, it just simply as it is. And uh, the other method of it is to download not by URL, but by some query selectors, which means that, I mean, essentially in the pack broker, we can have multiple um, versions of the same packs. So uh, in if we store the packs in our directory, we should always override them or give them unique name. But in the pack broker, this is like the version control system for our packs. We will have some sort of a hash that uniquely identifies our packed versions and we can store them and execute it and execute our provider tests against uh, some older or newer versions of our packs, which is pretty, pretty important and useful. And here is the point where I will show you a real short demo, the second demo. 
So, okay. Um, yeah, if we go back to our demo project, uh, everything remains basically the same. Um, especially for the consumer part. I don't even go to the consumer side anymore. Um, yeah, except I wanted to remove this one. It's because of this one, everything will fail. Yeah, but uh, in terms of the code and infrastructure itself, everything remains the same for the consumer part. So we uh, launched our tests, everything goes smoothly, everything has been passed. But after that, we wanted to share it somehow with uh, with our provider team. We wanted to put it into the Pack Broker. So, uh, what is the Pack Broker? Pack Broker is a standalone solution. It is available as a Docker uh, image. So, in my local machine, I have already launched that. So, I have the Pack Broker container up and running on my machine, and I have the Postgres um, container running. Uh, for this pack broker. This is important because uh, the pack broker should store somewhere all of these files and its versions. For it, it uses the Postgres uh, database. Uh, this pack broker exposes one URL that you can define. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So if I go with this link, yeah, uh, I've already done some testing. So as you can see, I have these two files, countries consumer and currency consumer. This is exactly the same files as in my local director here. And how can I uh, push them to the pack broker? Everything is done via the packed CLI. This is just the common line interface that is available for packed, either as a standalone exec uh, executable, um, tool or as a Docker image or as a GitHub action. So there are a lot of ways how you can do that. You can even uh, create, not create, but you use uh, the standalone Azure DevOps uh, step and configure it and it will launch uh, everything without your uh, manual interaction. But for the demo purpose, I will use uh, the a Docker image. So I already have downloaded the packed foundation pack seller image here. This is exactly what we need. And I will launch the command from my command line on my Windows machine. So um, let's sort of unwind a little bit what we have here. So uh, in order to do that, I have to up and run my Docker image. And I have to put some parameters here, some attributes. Uh, these are two. These two attributes are pretty essential because this is what um, we need in order to uh, authorize uh, our user in in the Postgres. So yeah, these are two default uh, values here. So this is the uh, username. This is the password and to our Postgres instance. This is the URL where our pack broker instance uh, up and running, and everything that is. Uh, after that is completely um, optional. So this is the uh, version of our consumer app. And in the same way, you can specify the version of your provider app. Uh, since I'm not using any GitHub action or whatever, I just use the random function here that returns me a random set of numbers. And the only like tricky part with this is that we have to pass the file from my local computer to the Docker container where our pack broker is running. So I have to actually mount my uh, local file onto the Docker volume, but like it's not really a part of my demo. This is more about the uh, Docker usage, but yeah, this is what, yeah, this is what uh, is actually stands for the mount in my uh, file onto the Docker container, Docker value, uh, volume, sorry. So um, I think that's it for this one. And yeah, I will use already prepared, um, prepared comment. And if I hit done, yeah, it says that pack successfully published. And if I go back to my pack broker, I will see that, yeah, it's been successfully published less than a minute ago. And I, I have here all the needed information about that 
uh, packed files. So I have my version, the branch uh, of the consumer. I will have the same on the provider side if I specify it. Uh, I can see the exact rules. So you don't need to parse uh, the JSON file in your brains. Everything is completely clear and obvious here. And the only remaining part is that we have to download it somehow from your uh, provider part, provider side. So in your provider test, everything that you should do is to remove this one with well file source. So we do not use the file source anymore. Everything that you should do is to use this method with URI source and provide the URI of your pack broker instance. So I just uncomment this one. And if I hit run, it should automatically download the packed. And yeah, it's been passed. And like, in order to assure you that it's not been mocked or whatever, I will stop my uh, containers here. So yeah, I think then been stopped. And if I run it once again, it should fail because it cannot connect to the pack broker instance. Yeah, it's been failed. And if I go here, it should say something like, cannot, yeah, request failed because the request for this URL where my pack broker is um, up and running is failed because no connections can be established. Um, so yeah, that's basically it for the second demo. And I go back to my presentation. It'll be real quick, just like two additional minutes of your attention. So yeah, uh, I have just two more slides and this is basically the one of possible uh, contract testing integrations into your CI/CD pipelines. So let's imagine that you have I mean, obviously you will have two different pipelines for your consumer and provider applications. And let's start with the consumer part. The consumer part remains pretty much the same as with the normal CI-CD pipeline. So you have the consumer, consumer built, you uh, run and executed your like, traditional unit test, then you executed your isolated unit test in a contract testing uh, methodology, then you generate your packed file and you publish it to your pack broker instance. And that's it, you deploy your consumer to the production or make some any, any other steps that you perform usually. The most, interesting, the most interesting part is the provider side. So on the provider side, you build your provider or producer, uh, do your some other unit tests and start executing your uh, provider verification against your Packed files. But before that, you have to download your packs from the uh, pack broker, as I just showed you. It can be done via the um, GitHub action or just uh, directly in your code or whatever ways you prefer. So then you deploy your application onto some test environment in order to execute your provider tests. You actually run your isolated test against the downloaded packs. And then you optionally provide a verification results back to the pack broker just to store some um, I don't know, audit logs or some history there. And then you deploy it to prod. So basically that's simple as it is. And really the last part is that uh, how to reach the pack nirvana. Like pack nirvana is the term uh, that pack team brought uh, like several months ago. They uh, Essentially, they provided a really good guideline of how to get like a master degree in contract testing and impact usage. So these are steps of which you like optionally have to know and should be aware of if you really wanted to be a master in contract testing. So for instance, they have the really complex matching rules. I haven't showed that on my real demo because of due to lack of time, but yeah, you may find a really great matching rules using regex, um, flexible length matching, uh, some uh, other matching for authorization headers and cookie files, and etc. cetera. Uh, the PACT also provides a way to integrate your tests into your PRs, which is like really great. Uh, it 
also provides the tool which uh, is called can I deploy? So this is a, a beautiful thing. Like let's imagine that for instance, you run a packed verification on, for example, on Monday, everything verify, verify is successful on your provider side, but you didn't deploy your provider onto the uh, production environment. And you decided to deploy your uh, provider or producer on Friday, but it's been like four days since then. And the consumer side changes multiple times from that point. And can I deploy? This is basically a comment in Pact CLI that verifies your versions of your packs against which you uh, last, against which you successfully uh, verified your provider last time. And uh, yeah, and like many, many others. So the pact is the so rich and well-known uh, tool that allows you to test your uh, communications like in really uh, re rich ways and uh, sets of rules. So yeah, it also provides like various things uh, for the team to automate your process as much deep as you want. So this is really a great tool and I wish all of you can know about it uh, even more. So yeah, that's basically it from my side and uh, any questions or comments or suggestions. Yeah.